Hello and welcome to Mormon Kabbalah 101. My name is David Fairman. I'm the first elder of the Church of Jesus Christ in Christian Fellowship. I've been working on this ministry for nearly four years and teaching Mormon Kabbalah for a year and a half. Today we're going to be discussing Teshuva and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's begin with an opening prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before thee humbly this day, thanking thee for the opportunity we have to learn more of thee and thy will and to discuss our salvation, to discuss the return path back to thee through thy Son, Jesus Christ. We not only thank thee for this opportunity, we also ask thee humbly to allow us to speak spirit to spirit, that not only will our ears be open and our eyes be open, but our souls be open as well to hear thy voice, that we may grow closer to thee and learn more of thy gospel. We thank thee for the opportunity we have to fellowship together as saints in the name of Christ, and we thank thee that you have blessed us with the desire to learn more of thee and thy ways. Please bless us in this endeavor, we pray. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, so mote it be. Amen. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. Mark 1.15 That time that was fulfilled was Christ coming to the earth to show us how to live the law, how to keep the covenant. The kingdom of God is the bringing together, the unifying of heaven and earth. How do we do this? We repent and believe the gospel. We know the gospel is the good news of Christ. How do we repent and believe? Let's begin with Teshuvah. This is a Hebrew word that is generally translated as repentance. However, its true meaning is return, as in returning to the original state, our original state. As we come to Christ, we don't leave our old lives behind, but we set ego aside. We set pride aside. We walk away from sin and towards God. What we're really doing when we say this is we're returning to the path that we were on before we lost sight of who we truly are. So naturally, the question many people ask is, well, when was this? I wasn't born knowing about God. We were with God before we were born. This is evident from a number of scriptures, including Psalms 82.6, John 10.34-36, 1 Nephi 1, 126-127 in the RAV, or the Community of Christ, RLDS tradition, and 17.36, chapter 17, verse 36 in the OPV, or the Utah Brigham Young tradition. We knew God. We're all the children of Elohim. We accepted Christ in the pre-mortal world, and now, here on earth, we get back on that path by accepting Christ in this life. As we do this, we are returning to Elohim as Christians, children of the Messiah. By studying Mormon Kabbalah, we are really just relearning that which we already know, that which we already knew. We have just forgotten it, and we need reminders here in the mortal realm. And this is why we say that we are Israel. Israel is really two words put together, Yasher and El, which means straight to the Creator. So when we say Israel, what we're really saying is that we are on the straight path back to God. We are on the path of Teshuvah. So what is Teshuvah? Teshuvah is when we set aside ego, sin, that false sense of happiness, to embrace altruism. Because true happiness comes from the desire to give, the desire to help in the spirit of Ubuntu. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it because we are as one. Now, we already went over Ubuntu in the first week's class. So I'm not going to go over that again. But I do want to point out that Teshiva is the return to the path of happiness that we've been separated from by ego. Ego leads us to sin, which gives us a false sense of happiness. Eventually, we see how hollow this happiness is. And what makes it hollow? Well, the reality is that when you're trying to feed ego, the grass is just continually, it's just always greener on the other side of the fence. Everything is always just out of reach. There's this forever one more trying to feed ego's greed and will never truly be satisfied. And this is why Lehi taught that mankind is that we might have joy. 
We are tempted by ego to think that returning from sin leads to sorrow because we have to come to Christ with this broken heart and contrite spirit. But Teshuvah, that return path back to God, leads us past that illusion of the unhappiness of ego's worldly pleasures. Once we are born again, we see that true happiness comes when we reject ego for altruism and the spirit of Ubuntu. This is best understood by the two greatest commandments, love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. Why? That is really the law. The covenant is just teaching us how to obey that law. God loves us as a parent loves a child, only infinitely more so. As we grow to love God, we can't help but grow to love others because all are God's creation. And as we realize this and our eyes are open, this path leads us into the eternal bliss of God's love. It's a world that can only be understood by those whose eyes have been opened through Christ. With our eyes open, we can see the world as Elohim sees. Over time, we grow in grace, and that growth returns us by restoring our vision of the world to see it as it truly is, a blessed creation of God. By changing our perspectives, Teshuva changes all of reality, and we are reminded of what Elohim said of the creation in Genesis 1. It is good. In the Bible, there is a call for Teshuva in Joel 2.13. And rend your heart, not your garments, and return to YHVH, your Elohim. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. We are born again with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. What does this mean to have a broken heart? In Kabbalah, there's a story of a man trying to drink from a stream of fresh flowing water. He's thirsty, but he cannot drink because the water tastes bitter. So he curses the stream. Then in his anger, he continues to be thirsty. And he's thirsty in spite of the freely available water right there in his reach. Then, upon closer inspection, he realizes that his cup is dirty. So he cleans his cup. And after cleaning his cup, he can drink in abundance and enjoy the water, never again being thirsty. Now in this story, the water represents the love of God, and the cup is our hearts. God gives us nothing but good, that which is best for us. But this water will taste dirty to us until we clean our cups, our kli, our vessels. This is why we perceive pain in our world. Pain gives us perspective, allowing us to enjoy the pleasure. It allows us to grow so we're not simply slaves to the light. And this realization is the broken heart. We stop blaming God for things we see as negative and realize that it's our hearts, our cups, our kli that are dirty. A broken heart in Kabbalah is known as the point of the heart or a pierced heart. It is a prayer written on our hearts, a plea to God. And this happens because we feel in our hearts the reality of God. Our perspective has changed and we recognize that ego has taken us from the path. Now through Teshiva, we're going to return to that path. And we're going to do that by dividing the light from the darkness. There are four weeks of Teshiva, And on each day of each of these weeks, we will read the creation story and meditate upon each day in the creation one at a time. Each day fits relative to the week that we are on. And we don't do it alone. Through Teshiva, we do it being filled with the Holy Spirit. The first week is self-reflection. Where have we been? Where are we now? Where do we need to go? After that reflection, we began really the first true week of Teshuvah, and that is Keter, being born again. Now, Keter is the crown, the topmost sephirot on the tree of life. It rests between Da'at and Hakma, which are knowledge and wisdom, and it is beyond our comprehension. This is the first sephirot we obtain because Christ's grace fully perfects us. That grace then guides us throughout the tree of life. Now, Keter is seen as interchangeable with Bina, which is the hidden Sephirot directly below, and Bina means understanding. With that understanding, our perception changes so we may see through God's eyes. Keter walks us through the first step, the broken heart or pierced heart and the contrite spirit. We acknowledge that we're fallen beings. We eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But, unlike Adam, Lilith, and Eve, we do so with God's permission. Knowing good and evil is not enough. God has given us free agency. 
And this agency allows us two options. We can willingly allow Christ's grace to use us, guide us, direct us, and transform us, or we can be used as a blunt instrument. God's will will be done regardless. So do we want to be a scalpel or a hammer? Our freedom merely allows us to decide how we will be a part of the sacred story. Let's talk for a moment about the contrite spirit. Now, Merriam-Webster defines contrite as one, quote, feeling or showing sorrow and remorse for a sin or shortcoming, end quote. Once the heart has been pierced and broken, because we've realized the harm the ego has caused, we feel guilt. This sorrow and remorse is expressed through our contrite spirits. It's just a natural part of Teshiva as we separate the darkness of ego and move towards the light of altruism. While the broken heart helps draw us back nearer to God, the contrite spirit allows us to right wrongs and mend harm done by ego. We can become more like the Creator, our Heavenly Parents. We know good from evil, and we're using this knowledge and wisdom to separate the light from the darkness within. The pierced or broken heart has borne the fruit of our faith in Jesus Christ. The contrite spirit takes us deeper into repentance. Now, the third week of Teshiva is Geburah, the return. This is the repentance I was just talking about. After traveling through Kedar, being born again, we move to Geburah, which is Hebrew for strength. It is the fifth Sephirot in the Tree of Life, and is below Da'at, which is Hebrew for knowledge, and across from Hesit, mercy, and above Hod, eternity. Geburah is the essence of Din, the way of life, or judgment, or limitation. It is fire. It represents the left hand of God, the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's fire that will cleanse and perfect us. Or, if we do not walk the path of Teshiva, it will condemn us and destroy us. It is Christ's grace that perfects us and allows us to use that fire to be cleansed. Gevura, then, is the internal transformation. It's our confession as we wash away ego and sin. It is our strength from God. It is our repentance, it is our teshuvah, it is our new path as we return. When we say that we've returned to become a new being or a new creature, we're referring to our flesh. Our godly spirits and mortal bodies have become one, and our physical bodies now wish to be like or resemble our spirits in purity. We were all perfect in the pre-mortal worlds. We were perfect creations of God. This desire to return allows us to acknowledge our sins and be judged by them. And thanks to Christ's atonement, justice has been served by mercy. And this allows us to do something that we could never do on our own, and that is to grow, to heal the damage our physical bodies have done to our souls. And through this, we're able to return to Elohim as perfect beings through Christ, access Bina, so that we can have a glimpse of the eternity that is Keter. The fourth and final week of Teshuvah, is hesed, which is Hebrew for kindness or love. This is the restoration. Through this week of Teshiva, we begin to enter what's known as Tekken Olam, repairing the world. And we'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. But for now, just know that the restoration or mercy is the healing portion of Teshiva. Now, being the healing portion, it has two parts. First, it completes the return by healing us. And second, it heals us when we have been spiritually harmed by others. Sin has two effects, damage to the sinner and damage to those that have been sinned against. And this power combined has a third effect, and that is the ministry. Obviously, we can't harm God when we sin. We're sinning against God, but that, that doesn't hurt God in any way. But sin is a negative with both cause and effect. Being washed clean by Christ's grace feels wonderful, and it's very empowering. But it doesn't just heal us. On its own, Teshiva can be seen really as ego fulfillment, and that's contrary to the whole point of being born again. So there has to be a way of not only healing ourselves, but those that have been harmed, and for God to heal us when we have been harmed. This is Heset. This is the atonement, the mercy of Christ healing us, healing the wrongs done against us. And this is the ministry. Because we have that love of God in us, we move forward in Christ and desire to help others. Now, in other classes, I've gone into a lot more detail about each day in a week of Teshuvah meditations. And I will get into that more in a future installment of these classes. But for now, what we want to do is just break it down and look at this as a quick overview. 
And the first day of the first week, we're dividing the light from the darkness. That's Genesis 1, 1 through 5. Where are we in ourselves? How can we enjoy more of the light of Christ, more of the light of God, more of God's love, and rid ourselves of more of the darkness? Yes, we're washed clean in Christ. We're still growing in grace. The second week, now we're looking at Adam and Eve partaking the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil without God's permission. God has called us today to seek Him. We're free to know good from evil, that we can find Him. So we're going to seek the light of God's love to replace the darkness of our own egos. So the first day, on the third week, we're going to focus on regret. That is part of separating that light from the darkness. We understand that sin harms us. It harms others. It separates us from God. We must regret this damage as we take this first step forward away from darkness and towards God's light. And then in the fourth week, we have healing. Though that sin has harmed us and others, on this first day, we allow God to separate the light from the darkness, and the darkness is washed away by the warmth of the light. Being cleansed by that light, we are purified, and then we are moved by the Holy Spirit to do holy works. And that takes us right back again to where we were. Really, Teshuva works a lot like the lunar cycle. The Hebrew calendar is both solar and lunar. And if we start the first week of Teshuvah on a new moon, you have this little sliver of light, and it grows and grows and grows until you get to the middle. And at that point, you just really feel God's love. You've been healed, and that's the first two weeks. But the second two, regret, condolences, true change. Don't let ego grab a hold of the joy God has given you and put it on yourself like somehow you did something. Instead, you put it out to the world and say, what can I do for others? And that is the moon, the light of the moon getting smaller and smaller and smaller until the cycle starts again. On day two of the first week of Teshuvah, we're looking at the water divided between the earth and the heavens, Genesis 1, 6 through 8. So we have the waters in the firmament and the waters in the seas, the oceans, the rivers. What is the water? It is God's mercy, Jesus Christ. Because we have partaken of the tree and see that we're naked, our perception is clear and we can see things as they really are. And we see that everything we have was given to us by God. On day two of week three, we're going to renounce. Just as the waters came on the earth, we are baptized and we wash away our sins. We cleanse ourselves from the things that separate us from God, desiring to place acts of ego, pride, and selfishness with acts of altruism. Then the fourth week, we have the washing. The waters have come, they've cleansed the pain that sin has caused, and it's helped us to become clean, and it helps us cleanse the pain that we have caused to others. Those waters are cool and refreshing, and they get deep inside of us, healing our wounds. And because our wounds are healed, we want others to be healed as well. Because we've been washed clean and made whole in God's peace, we want to extend that healing to everyone we know. And that light of Christ shines from us because that mercy has been washed through us. On the third day, dry land is revealed and vegetation grows. That's Genesis 1, 9-13. So we think to ourselves, what's been revealed? What's growing? In the second week, on the third day, we now clothe our ignorance. Because the rain has come, growth begins inside of us. The vegetation represents our new desires in Christ. The land is earth, Hakma, the wisdom of the Divine Feminine. She has given birth within us to God's mercy in answers to our prayer. Our clothing are the fig leaves of our altruistic actions. We're moved by grace to do good works, and by these works, our fruits will be seen, and those seeking Christ will partake of those fruits. The third week, we confess. The vegetation has sprung from the ground, and just like that, on the third day, we bear the fruits of confession. We have to separate the land from the seas, the guilt and the shame, admitting to what we've done to ourselves and to God and to those that we've harmed. And by doing this, on the fourth week, we can focus on new works. The vegetation springing forth from us causes us to take action. We are the ones that did a harm. And we're moved by God to admit our mistakes and work to heal those we have harmed. And we do this work as we're moved by the Spirit. It's not something we can do on our own, just like it's grace that saves us, salvation moves us into action. But it's the Holy Spirit that tells us what to do, that leads, guides, and directs us. And that leads us into the fourth day. On the fourth day, we receive the lights of the firmament. That's Genesis 1, 14-19. What are these lights? 
the lights are used as a sign just for us to see the way. In our meditation, in the first week, we take a look, where are we? In the second week, these lights become the fire of the Holy Spirit, that judgment that guides us. The Holy Spirit will lead us and show us the way. As we rise in degrees, we find a new darkness, a new challenge that God will guide us through. On the third week, we begin to reconcile on the fourth day. That sun, moon, and stars are lighting our path and giving us signs in the firmament. So again, Gevura, the Holy Spirit, that's what's actually going to guide us. As we access this deity, our paths will be lit and the gap created between us and God will be bridged. It will stir Christ's grace within us, moving us to do his works. And as we do his works, we're doing our part, mending the bridges broken by our egos, that the warmth of the sun may be felt by all. Then the fourth week, we have a new path. With the sun, moon, and the stars lighting our way, the Holy Spirit guides us forward. We're back on track, leaving past sins, pride, and ego behind. This allows us to do more than just be healed. We're now able to move beyond our own needs and be a light into the world helping others. Remember the story? Well, our clea has been washed clean, our cup is clean, and that light just pours from us. And now we're at the fifth day. Living creatures of the sea and the air are created. And that's Genesis 1, 20 through 23. These represent deeper desires, deeper works that we're called to do. So in that first week, we start meditating on the things that the Lord has asked us to do. Where are we in these tasks? What more do we have to accomplish? In the second week, these living creatures represent the desires within us, and they are of air and water. Whereas before we had earth and water, the divine feminine and the Christ, now we have air, knowledge, and Christ, da'at and hakma. God the Father and God the Son. So through this, we can grow in both grace and knowledge. So in the third week, we make amends. While only Christ can truly repay our sins, our wrongs, our wrongdoing, we still must do our best to repair any damages caused by our egos. We must bring life to where there was once only the vegetation of confession. Now, our good deeds bear fruit and they multiply. God blesses both those that did harm and those that were harmed. Then in the fourth week, we can move on to greater works. As we grow in grace, our good deeds bear fruit and multiply. We want to bring others to Christ. God moves us like the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, swift, ever singing his praise. We're seeking to help heal all that have been harmed, and he's called us to minister to those in need. To some, that's a literal ministry. To others, it's just being in the right place at the right time. And now, in day six, we have living creatures, every other creature, being born after its own kind. Genesis 1, 24 through 31. So in the first week, we focus on the greater desires. You know, first there's the vegetation, then there's the birds and the fish, and now we've got just everything else, including human beings. This is when we are created. What does that mean to us? That's the first week. In the second week, we recognize how, as we've grown in grace, we're born anew. What are these animals? God brought the animals to Adam to name in the second chapter of Genesis. Well, these are the desires within us. And through Christ's grace, we tame these desires. Everything God has given us, every desire, we may use to glorify him. Here, we too are given the charge to care for the world that God has created within us. And this is both a commandment to continue to grow in grace and also to share the fruit of the tree to bring more souls to Christ back to that God that created them. So in the third week, this means resolve. That's our meditation. We have been created as new creatures. By working through the first five steps, we're new men and women born again in Christ. We're humans created in the image of God. With renewed focus, we must now move forward resolving not to repeat sin because we want to bear the fruit of this new person that we've become in Christ. And in the fourth week, we recognize that we've been moved to do greater works. Like I said, as we grow in grace, our good deeds bear fruit and multiply. We now wish to bring others to God, to Christ. And now in the fourth week, we see our mission, that view forward. With our newfound understanding, God has called us to bring Teshuvah not only to ourselves, but to the world. We are called to be fishers of men. Many are lost, and now, because our perception has changed, we can hear their cries. 
We understand now that the call to repentance isn't a wall of chastisement, but it's a bridge we build through acceptance and love. And by loving others, we're now active in building God's kingdom, the new Eden here on earth. The seventh is the same across the board. It is the Sabbath. It is the moment of rest. We just give everything to Christ. We say, I've done everything that I can do, and it's not enough. So I rest from this labor, and I give it to you, knowing that you will make me whole. And as we go through these weeks, the first one, we, we know ourselves a little better. We analyze, we see, we look, we feel. We develop that special relationship with the Holy Spirit. In the second week, we recognize that we're God's new creation. We have pierced hearts. We have access to the tree of life. By being born again, we're new beings in Christ. We reject ego, the darkness, and move towards altruism, the light. Our clea, our vessels, and our hearts are washed clean so we can drink of the water of life freely and taste of its goodness. We accept Christ. When I say that, I mean we fully accept him. That doesn't mean that we have completely let go of all of our sins or our ego. What it does mean is that as a new creature, we've been washed clean by Christ's grace so that we can grow within it. And this transformation allows us to move forward as perfected beings in each of the stages of Teshiva. And looking back in the third week, we are learning to do God's will. Ego is going to try to step back in and move against us. Nagging doubts are going to creep in. But by building that relationship with the Holy Spirit, we gain a powerful guide and a protector. Remember, God doesn't want us to fail. He sent his son not to condemn us or destroy us, but to save us. His plan for our happiness is the reason everything is happening. So as the Holy Spirit transforms us, we move beyond merely accepting Christ's mercy. The Holy Spirit fine-tunes us into tools and instruments that can be used in building God's creations. At the end of the fourth week, we recognize that to be fully restored, we must continue learning, growing, teaching, and building. We're growing grace by grace in Christ. And that way to grow is now not merely inside of us, building our own relationship with God. Now we find others because by helping them grow, we grow. As we teach others and guide them, we will be taught and we will be guided by those that we teach. No one person has all the answers. This is why God has taught us to worship with others. Where two or more gather in my name, there am I because we're not alone. We're all in this together. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. This is the attitude that we have when we walk the path of Teshuvah. I am not my salvation. God is my salvation. I can't just trust in myself. I trust in the Lord. I'm not afraid because God is my strength and my song. He's literally become my salvation by what he did for us on the cross. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about quickly here is Tecumolum, repairing the world. When we come to Christ, we're born again. Our broken hearts and contrite spirits recreate us into new spiritual beings. And as we know, the changes of Teshiva are about returning to who we truly are, the spiritual beings beyond this world. So we're reborn in Christ, not necessarily as merely a new creation, but as our true creation, our true selves. And this leads us to obedience to God. Our hearts are pierced and the cleave vessel within is filled. And the light of God's love pours from us through altruism. And this outward expression of our inner change is known as tekanolam. Now tekanolam is Hebrew for repair of the world, literally translated. It's also understood to mean construction for eternity. It refers to the Teshiva construction of the world where we are created in those seven days we just discussed. So there is an ancient maxim, as above, so below, as below, so above. And this can be seen in Matthew 16, 19. Tekken Olam is about fulfilling this mandate as commanded by the Lord. Remember, every man is Adam and every woman is Eve. And because we have male and female inside of us, we're all Adam and Eve. So this first commandment we were given to take care of the earth has been given to all of us. We are to help in the creation process. So how do we fulfill Tekanolam? Well, we live our lives with Tekanolam in our prayers and rituals. We let the light of Christ fill and flow from our clea. We love and help our neighbors. This brings the light of Christ into their lives, giving them the opportunity to taste of God's fruit and be born again. 
In addition, we care for the earth and all of its creatures. This means we use resources responsibly, and we support people, companies, campaigns, governments that do so peaceably, requesting that those that do not respect the earth and respect its creatures change their ways. Now, there are things we can do by using the sealing powers of the priesthood through prayer and other means spiritually to prepare the earth for Christ's return, which really began about 200 years ago when the Lord came to Joseph Smith. But it's our actions, it's our attitude that's really going to transform things. And I know this sounds like this is too much. This is an overwhelming task. There's no way I can do this. But remember what the Savior taught us. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest into your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Faith moves mountains. Prayer, meditation, fasting. These will be the vehicle used by Mormon Kabbalists to bring about the will of the Lord. Let the Holy Spirit be our guide. Again, the Lord is on our side. How can we fail? Ego tells us, on the one hand, that we are so great and we can do anything, but that's only when it comes to sin. Ego and pride always make us feel weak and powerless when it comes to doing God's will. So as we reject ego and embrace altruism, the world is being corrected because we're a part of God's creation. We are a part of this world. And as we're corrected, we set that example. We push that light out and that in turn corrects the world.